This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2021. Lesson 10 from our series Present Truth in Deuteronomy is titled Remember, Do Not Forget, ready for teaching on December 4. And I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 27. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we remember you each week on the Sabbath, but we also need to remember you each day of the week and not forget that you are the one who led your people through the wilderness. You are the one who sent your Son that each of us could have eternal life. And wherever we're listening today, whether it's in Canada or Cyprus or Hong Kong or Bali or Brisbane or Barbados or Buenos Aires or Bloemfontein or Beijing or Brussels or Brighton, we just want to thank you that we can turn in your word and find you there, that your Holy Spirit helps us interpret the words so that we may know what your will is for us. Help us to remember what we read this week. Help us to remember and not forget. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 7. It reads, Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place. You have been rebellious against the Lord. Let's read that again. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 7. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Two words appear all through the Bible. Remember and forget. Both refer to something human, something that happens in our minds. Both are verbs and both are opposites. To remember is not to forget, and to forget is not to remember. God often tells his people to remember all the things that he has done for them, to remember his grace for them and his goodness toward them. So much of the Old Testament consisted of the prophets telling the people, the Hebrew people, not to forget what the Lord had done for them. But also, most important, they were not to forget what their calling in him was and what kind of people they were to be in response to that calling. Psalm 77, 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. Is it any different for us today, both at a corporate level and even more so at a personal one? How easy is it to forget what God has done for us? This week, as expressed in Deuteronomy, we'll look at this important principle, that of remembering and not forgetting God's interaction in our lives. Sunday, November 28, Remembering the Rainbow The first time the word remember appears in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 9, when, after the worldwide flood, the Lord told Noah that he would put the rainbow in the sky as a sign of his covenant with all earth, that he would never again destroy all the earth with a flood. Read Genesis 9, 8-17. How is the word remember used here, and what can we learn from its use for how we should remember what God has done for us? Genesis 9, beginning at verse 8, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. 
And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Of course, God didn't need the rainbow to remember his promise and his covenant. He just spoke in language that humans could understand. If anything, the rainbow is for us as humans to remember God's promise and covenant not to destroy the world again by water. In other words, the rainbow was to help people remember this special covenant that God had made. Each time the rainbow appeared, God's people would remember not only God's judgment upon the world for its sin, but also his love for the world and his promise not to flood it again. Hence, we see here the importance of the idea of remembering, remembering God's promises, remembering God's warnings, remembering God's action in the world. The rainbow in the sky becomes even more important today when, based on the continuity of the laws of nature, many scientists reject the idea that there ever was a worldwide flood to begin with. How fascinating that Ellen G. White wrote that, before the flood came, many people had the same idea that the continuity of the laws of nature ruled out the possibility that a worldwide flood could ever happen. She wrote that the wise men argued that nature's laws are so firmly established that God himself could not change them. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 97. So, before the flood, people argued, based on the laws of nature, that it couldn't come. After the flood, people argue, based on the laws of nature, that it never came to begin with. However, God in his word told us about the flood and gave the world a sign, not only of the flood, but also of his promise not to bring one again. Thus, if we remember what the rainbow means, we can have the assurance, written across the sky in these beautiful colours, that God's word is true, and if we can trust his word on this promise, why not trust his word on all that he tells us as well? So to finish today... Next time you see a rainbow, think of God's promises. How can we learn to trust all of these promises? Monday, November 29, Concerning the Days That Are Past In Deuteronomy chapter 4, we have read the wonderful admonitions that the Lord gave to his people through Moses regarding their great privileges as God's chosen people. He had redeemed them out of Egypt by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Deuteronomy 4 verse 34. In other words, not only did God do something great for you, but he also did it in ways that should help you remember and never forget what great things he has done for you. Read Deuteronomy 4, 32-39. What was the Lord telling them to remember? And why was it so important that they remember these things? Deuteronomy 4, beginning at verse 32. For ask now concerning the days that are past, which were before you, since the day that God created man on the earth, and ask from one end of heaven to the other whether any great thing like this has happened, or anything like it has been heard. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as you have heard, and live? 
Or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. Out of heaven he let you hear his voice, that he might instruct you. On earth he showed you his great fire, and you heard his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their descendants after them, and he brought you out of Egypt with his presence and with his mighty power, driving out from before you nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you in, to give you their land as an inheritance as it is this day. Therefore know this day, and consider it in your heart, that the Lord himself is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. Moses points the people back through all history, even to the creation itself, and asks them rhetorically if anything in all history had ever been done as was done for them. In fact, he tells them to ask, that is, to study for themselves, and see if anything such as what they experienced had ever happened before. By asking them a few questions, Moses was trying to get them to realise by themselves what the Lord had done for them, and thus ultimately how grateful and thankful to him they should be for his mighty acts in their lives. Central to these acts was the deliverance from Egypt, and then, perhaps in some ways even more astonishing, God speaking to them at Sinai, which allowed them to hear his words out of the midst of of the fire. Read Deuteronomy 4 verse 40. What conclusion then did Moses want the people to draw from these words about what God had done for them? Deuteronomy 4 verse 40. You shall therefore keep his statutes and his commandments which I command you today that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God is giving you for all time. The Lord didn't do all those things for no purpose. He had redeemed his people, keeping his end of the covenant that he had established with them. They were freed from Egypt, about to enter the promised land. God did his part. They were now called on to do theirs, which was simply to obey. And so to finish the day, how does this model represent the plan of salvation as expressed in the New Testament? What did Jesus do for us, and how are we to respond to what he has done for us? Let's look at Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Tuesday, November 30, Take Heed, Lest You Forget. Read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9 and verse 23. What is the Lord telling them to do here, and why is this admonition so important for the nation? Deuteronomy 4, verse 9, Only take heed for yourself, and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. And verse 23, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. Two verbs dominate the opening of both these verses. Take heed and forget. What the Lord is saying to them is, take heed so that you don't forget. That is, don't you forget what the Lord has done for you, nor the covenant that he has made with you. The verb take heed, spelt S-M-R, 
which also is used in a different form in Deuteronomy 4.9, translated there as keep yourself, occurs all through the Old Testament, and it means to keep, to watch, to preserve, and to guard. Interestingly enough, the first time it appears in Scripture is even before sin, when the Lord told Adam to keep the garden that he had given to him in Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. Now, though, the Lord tells the people, each one individually, the verb is in the singular, to guard themselves lest they forget. This is not forget so much in the sense of memory loss, though over time and in new generations that could come, but more in the sense of being lax about their covenant obligations. That is, they were to be mindful about who they were and what that meant in terms of how they were to live before God, before other Hebrews, before the strangers among them, and before the nations around them. Read Deuteronomy 4.9 again, and also Deuteronomy 6.7 and Deuteronomy 11.19. But focus on the last part about the Israelites, teaching the nation's history to their children and grandchildren. What would that have to do with helping them not to forget? First of all, Deuteronomy 4.9, Only take heed to yourselves and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. And chapter 6, verse 7, You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And chapter 11, verse 19, You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. It's not a coincidence that right after Moses tells them not to forget, not to let these things depart from your heart, he tells them to teach these things to the next generation and to the generation after. Not only did their children need to hear about these things, but also, perhaps even more important, by telling and retelling the stories of what God had done for them, the people would not forget what those things were. Hence, what better way to preserve knowledge of what the Lord had done for his chosen people? And so to finish today, how has telling others of your experience with the Lord benefited not just others, but yourself as well? How has the recounting of God's leading helped you not to forget his leadings? Wednesday, December 1, Eaten and Full One former church leader who had worked at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists for 34 years told a story about how many years earlier he and his wife, having landed at an airport, had lost a piece of luggage. Right there, he said, by the luggage conveyor belt and in public, we got on our knees and prayed, asking the Lord for the return of our lost luggage. He then said that many years later the same thing happened. They arrived at the airport, but a piece of luggage didn't. He told what happened next. Don't worry, he had said to his wife, insurance will cover it. With this story in mind, read Deuteronomy 8 verses 7 to 18. What warning is the Lord giving to his people here, and what should it mean for us today as well? Deuteronomy 8, beginning at verse 7. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten 
eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built multiple houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that great great and terrible wilderness, in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end, then you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Look at what being faithful to the Lord could bring them. Not only would they possess a wonderful and rich land, and in verse 9, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, but also they would be exceedingly blessed in that land, flocks and herds and gold and silver and beautiful houses. That is, they would be given all the material comforts that this life affords. But then what? They would face the danger that always attends wealth and physical prosperity, that of forgetting that it was only the Lord who gave them power to get wealth. Verse 18 of chapter 8. Maybe not at first, but as the years go by, they have all the material comforts that they need. They will forget their past, forget how the Lord has led them through that great and terrible wilderness, Deuteronomy 1.19, and indeed think that it was their own smartness and talents that enabled them to be so successful. This is precisely what the Lord was warning them against doing, and unfortunately, especially as one reads the later prophets, this is exactly what happened to them. Thus, amid this prosperity, Moses tells them to remember that it was the Lord alone who had done this for them, and not to be deceived by the material blessings that he had given them. Centuries later, Jesus himself warned in the parable of the sower about the deceitfulness of riches in Mark 4.19. So, to finish the day, no matter how much money and how many material possessions we have here, we are all flesh and blood, awaiting a hole in the ground. What should this tell us about the dangers that come from wealth, in that wealth can make us forget our need of the only one who can deliver us from that hole in the ground? Thursday, December 2. Remember that you were a slave. Read Deuteronomy 5.15, 6.12, 15.15, 16.3 and 16.12, 24.18 and 24.22. What specifically did the Lord want the people never to forget and why? Deuteronomy 5.15. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. And 6.12 Then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And chapter 15, verse 15 You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this thing today. And chapter 16, verse 3, you shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it, that is, the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt, 
all the days of your life. In chapter 16 and verse 12, And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. And chapter 24, verses 18, But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore I command you to do this thing. And verse 22, And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command you to do this thing. As we have seen, all through the Old Testament, the Lord constantly brought the minds of the people back to the Exodus, their miraculous deliverance by God from Egypt. To this day, thousands of years later, practicing Jews keep the Passover celebration, a memorial to what the Lord has done for them. It will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be, when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? That you shall say, It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. Exodus 12, 25-27 for the church today, the Passover is a symbol of the deliverance we have been offered in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7 we read, For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Read Ephesians 2, 8-13. What are these Gentile believers told to remember? How does it parallel what the Hebrews in Deuteronomy were told to remember as well? Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of of Christ. Paul wanted these people to remember what God had done for them in Christ, what he had saved them from, and what they now had because of God's grace to them. As with the children of Israel, it wasn't anything in and of themselves that commended them to God. Instead, it was only God's grace given to them, even though they were strangers from the covenants of promise that made them who they were in Christ Jesus. Whether Jews in the wilderness, Christians in Ephesus, or Seventh-day Adventists anywhere in the world, how crucial it is for us always to remember and not forget what God has done for us in Christ. No wonder, then, that we have these words from Desire of Ages, page 83. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. As with us dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, our confidence in him will be more constant, our love will be more quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. Friday, December 3. From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 106 and 107, Ellen White writes, How great the condescension of God and his compassion for his erring creatures in thus placing the beautiful rainbow in the clouds as a token of his covenant with men. The Lord declares that when he looks upon the bow, he will remember his covenant. This does not imply that he would ever forget. 
but he speaks to us in our own language that we may better understand him. It was God's purpose that as the children of after generations should ask the meaning of the glorious arch which spans the heavens, their parents would repeat the story of the flood and tell them that the Most High had bended the bow and placed it in the clouds as an assurance that the waters should never again overflow the earth. Thus, from generation to generation, it would testify of divine love to man and would strengthen his confidence in God. End of quote. Since the founding of Christianity, there has never been a church that has partaken of the wealth and creature comforts that the church in some countries of the world enjoys today. The question is, at what cost? Such affluence surely influences our spirituality, and not for good either. How could it? Since when have wealth and material abundance fostered the Christian virtues of self-denial and self-sacrifice? In most cases, the opposite occurs. The more people have, the more self-sufficient they become, and the less they tend to depend upon God. Wealth and prosperity, however nice, do come with many dangerous spiritual traps. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Discuss the question of how wealth, which can be very relative, that is, someone not deemed wealthy in his country might be seen as super rich by those in another one, impacts our spirituality. What are ways that those with money can protect themselves from some of the spiritual dangers that wealth can create? 2. In class, talk about the closing scenes in Christ's life and what they tell us about God's love for us and why we must never forget the reality of that love. What other things can you think of that reveal the goodness of God and why we should always keep this reality in mind? And three, though some scientists say that there was no worldwide flood, despite the Bible saying that there was and the rainbow. Some say there was no six-day creation either, despite the Bible saying that there was, and the seventh-day Sabbath to memorialise it. What should this tell us about what a powerful and negative impact culture can have on faith? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled First Time Visitor Knows All. It's by Elaine Hoshikawa Imayuki. Brazilian immigrant Sandra Sato drove straight to a Seventh day Adventist church in Kakagawa, Japan, to thank God for her newly acquired driver's license. She had promised God that if she got her license, the first place she would go with the car would be to the church. That evening, Sandra joyfully told members of the Tokoi Christian Centre Church that God had answered her prayers to obtain a driver's licence. And I'm also ready for baptism, she announced. The church members were surprised. They had never seen Sandra until that evening. Their astonishment grew as Sandra turned to various members and addressed them by name. I know many of you, she said. I have been watching live church broadcasts on social media. Then she told her story. Sandra and her husband, a former Adventist, worked with thousands of other Brazilian immigrants in factories in central Japan. While discussing religion, her husband had declared that if she ever wanted to worship, he would only accept her attending an Adventist church. She had belonged to another Christian denomination. Intrigued by her husband's former faith, Sandra had watched live broadcasts from the Takoi Christian Centre Church with her husband's help. She had completed Bible studies provided by Hope Channel's affiliate in Brazil. Then she had promised God that she would begin to attend church in person if she got her driver's license. After a review of the Bible with the Takoi Christian Centre pastor, Sandra was baptised. No family members attended the baptism, not even her husband. But her faith has remained strong. 
At her initiative, a small Bible study group has been established in another city, Awata, for people seeking to know Christ. God's Word is spreading in Japan. Read next week about how God is using the small group in Awata to bless other Brazilian immigrants. Sandra became familiar with the Tokoi Christian Centre Church after watching its online services. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will go to a project to help many Japanese people, especially young people, learn about Jesus through the internet. Thank you for planning a generous offering. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.